Ja. Det er jo hovedet ting. Det er jo sådan hovedet ting. Action. Everybody, welcome back to uh, another episode of Behind the Grind. It's been a very, very long time since the last one. Um, I've been quite busy, uh, and I think everyone in the world has also been quite busy based on what's happening these days. Uh, lots of uncertainty, not just in Pakistan but globally. I think uh, markets are constantly up and down. Everyone's in flux. So, if anything, once you hear this, how about we all just take a moment to really calm ourselves down a little bit, calm down, be in the moment, be present as well, uh, because we've got a long way ahead to go. and uh, that that's why today's discussion today's conversation is a bit different um it's not business oriented it's not startup oriented uh today's guest is uh, from the education space dr shahzad jiva is with us today dr jiva thank you so much for coming on thank you very much thank you so much for taking out the time i know it's it was uh, kind of last minute also to schedule this uh but uh, we made this happen and um Currently, congratulations, by the way, on officially becoming the the chief executive officer of the AKUEB. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to try and introduce you, uh, but this is what I could pick up from online sources. Uh, so, Dr. Jiva is, as I mentioned, he's the CEO of the Yaa Khan University Examination Board. He's been with the organization since 2014. Um, has really been driving it. Uh, he has seats in multiple local and international bodies. He's a member. He's a board of advisor also in many bodies as well. He was formerly the chairman of the IBCC and also a former chairman of the National Steering Commission uh, Committee at the IBCC. Um, he did his PhD in chemistry from Cambridge and did his fellowship, uh, the doc- postdoctoral fellowship from uh, University of York in McGill. Am I right? Uh, Uni- University of York in UK and, and then, then in McGill. Then McGill, Canada. Yes. and overall he if you follow the education space in pakistan if you're keeping um up to date with what's happening over here uh, i'm sure i'm sure you've seen him uh, pop up in many many spaces all together dr jiva um did i get all of this right or have i missed some key details or something that's missing that's perfect that's yeah? perfect awesome awesome so tell me a little bit about yourself now that the formal introduction is done tell me a little bit about yourself your background where you from what were you doing in a past life Thank you so very much for the lovely introduction. Uh I'm originally from Karachi, Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And uh I did my early education from low cost private school, then I went to uh government college mm-hmm. and then went to public sector university uh in Karachi and then moved on for my PhD. But the journey was um <clears throat> such that um you know, it's it was a time when uh when i was in grade 10th you know my elder brother he was doing his uh pre medicine from dj science college so at that time my my parents asked me so shizad uh, what do you want to be um and i had no answer so they said so you know if the elder is going towards medicine the younger would should go into engineering Mm-hmm. You know, you know, being a very docile child at the time, and uh, I agreed to it, and I went on to do my pre-engineering from DJ Science College, um, and uh, but but I could not visualize myself being an engineer. So um, I, you know, continued uh, my grade eleventh and grade twelfth. Mm-hmm. I, for the first time, studied organic chemistry as a subject. and i fell in love with with the subject itself and uh and i decided that uh this is something that i want to study more mm-hmm. uh never thought of uh going towards a career path at that time mm-hmm. but the focus was more towards uh understanding life through organic chemistry <clears throat> so i uh told my parents during our dinner time that i want to do my phd in organic chemistry and they looked at me and i said uh you know what about engineering i said no uh this is what i think i should be doing um and they asked they, they didn't say no mm. right away and what they said is 
why you want to do PhD in organic chemistry. Mm-hmm. And my response to them was because I want to know more about life through organic chemistry. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, you know, they they were they th- they told me that you know, Shizad, it's uh, we don't know exactly what kind of career path mm-hmm. there is going to be. Mm-hmm. And I said, as well, I don't know as well. Uh, so they introduced me to a lot of people uh, for guidance, mm-hmm. to seek guidance and see, you know, if this is the right field to choose. Uh, and trust me, everybody said no. Uh, no, Shizad, you'll become a chemist. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I kept telling myself, you know, I'll not be a chemist. I'll not make medicine. I'll not. I won't sell medicine. Uh-huh. I just want to know more about life through the subject. Scope is in question at that time. What's uh-huh. <laughs> scope? <kya hai? laughs> Bilkul, uh, you know, the, you know, in, in our country for many, many years, for decades, mm-hmm. uh, people have looked at medicine as a field and engineering as a field. And since of late, uh, ACCA or, you know, accountancy, yeah. uh, chartered accountancy, that has become a sort of a social status for our society where we live in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as I said, you know, I, I'm lucky that I was never asked this uh, or never given a statement mm-hmm. as no. Uh, it was from my family, why? So the rationale was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I went on to do my BSc honors in uh, chemistry, mm-hmm. uh, master's in organic chemistry. Then I went to University of Cambridge for my uh, PhD there in polymer chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a couple of years, I spent a couple of years in University of York in England, then in McGill in mm-hmm. Canada. And then I decided to come back to Pakistan. Okay. Which year uh, was this? That was in 2010 early. Okay. So I decided to come back to Pakistan. Um, several reasons, family reasons were there. Uh-huh. Um, and I started off with business then. Family business. Family business. Okay. That gave me a good um, exposure on management, uh-huh. leadership, decision making, marketing, sales, banking, mm-hmm. export, import, mm-hmm. operations, purchase. You know, these are very important elements uh, in life. You know, even in professional life, it really helps you. Mm-hmm. So for five years, I was into it. But to keep myself sane, I was also involved in education during that time as well. So I used to... Um, work uh, in social projects, my okay. own social projects to promote science learning in Pakistan. Okay. Uh, and this was through schools or this was like completely independent students would come to you? It was through schools, through, you know, I worked, I had a big project with Dawn. Okay. And for the Dawn Expo, we would do this for mm-hmm. students, uh, for children across Pakistan. Okay. Uh, in schools, it was quite good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, children would get fascinated by the wonders of science around them. You know, what I used to see, I started off when I came back to Pakistan, I started off with teaching as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But soon I realized this is something that uh, I'm not really enjoying much. Um, Not because that I didn't like to teach, Mm -hmm. but it was just the approach towards science uh, was quite different. Yeah. Um, for for students, I observed science uh, for them came out when they opened the textbooks mm-hmm. and the science vanished when they closed the textbook. Uh, and I still remember I was uh, uh, with some students, A-level students, and, uh, you know, we were in the laboratory and they had some chemicals, which was white in color. And they told me, uh, Dr. Jeeva, 
can we have this white thing? And I said, you know, have I ever called you, hey boy, come here? <laughs> yeah. I've always taken your name. Yeah. You know, this thing has a name as yeah. well. Um, even when we used to see the science fairs or science exhibition or projects, mm -hmm. uh, the depth that was supposed to be there was not yeah. was missing completely. Um, you you never saw students. Uh, you know, it was nice for them to be fancy. You know, you got fancy project there. Um, parents were happy. Uh, their kids looked smart. But you go in depth and ask few questions. Mm -hmm. They were unable to connect dots. Yeah. And that is when I decided that I want to start the social project, uh, which ended in a way when I joined Aga Khan University Examination Board mm -hmm. in 2014, October. Um, and then in 2015, we revamped our middle school program. Mm -hmm. And that's where I brought in project-based learning based on my experience because this was something I was involved in during my time at Cambridge, during my time uh, at York in mm -hmm. England with Salters, mm -hmm. which is a big thing in, yeah. in England, um, where students are um, shown what the wonders of science is. So they are really involved into it. They are getting experiential learning there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about not getting the results. It is more about the joy of learning that process. Yeah. Uh, and that is what you want to see. Yeah. And this is something that I saw missing here. Mm -hmm. So where are we going wrong with this? And this actually leads me to the next question is that what, what is the current state of the education space right now? And why, wh firstly, why is it on this path? Why are we here today? Um, the situation here in Pakistan with regards to education, uh, is very dire um, and you need to look at it from multiple lenses you know mm -hmm. you first start off by saying that as per the constitution of the pakistan mm -hmm. free education is compulsory for all till grade 10 mm -hmm. and if you look at that um, we have currently in Pakistan slightly over 50 million children in school who are enrolled in school. Out of these 50 million, 28 million children are from public sector and 22 million children are catered through private sector. Huge, huge ratio of students being catered by a uh, private sector um, which you would not find globally mm -hmm. what does that mean the government has not fulfilled its That's promise yeah. it's the it's their responsibility mm -hmm. and then we have an issue of um, uh, out of school children yeah those who have never seen the boundaries of schools. They've never been inside the boundaries of the schools. Mm -hmm. And the numbers, you know, it's there and then they've, they're not um, within that age group anymore, but they are now adults who've never seen. So that number has also grown yeah. over a period of time. The question that we must ask is why these things are happening, you know, Learning is secondary mm. versus the school itself. Yeah. Jab school hi nahi hai, to taaleem kahan se, ilm kahan se milega. Mm -hmm. To, you know, we don't have enough schools in the country. Yeah. Uh, we don't have enough teachers in the country. We've got many schools in the country which are single classroom or multi-grade uh, you know, classrooms, yeah. which means you've got students of grade one, two, three, four, and five sitting in the same classroom and you've got single teacher. The teacher is the chokidar. He's the watch guard. He opens the door, he closes the door, he cleans the 
school and this is also for those private schools as well but this is the reality yeah. you know in the public sector mm-hmm. we will come to the private sector as well yeah. there are major gaps there as mm-hmm. well uh so you know the access to school is a huge challenge uh, mm-hmm. the budget has never been uh the education budget has never been given that importance uh and that is why we continue to struggle mm-hmm. then we have poverty issue in mm-hmm. the country and when you have poverty issue of course the first thing the parents would say is the livelihood yeah uh the government came up with some very good incentives for the parents to encourage them mm-hmm. to come to schools uh you know they 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 told them that you know if you send your child to school we'll give you monthly uh food supplies really uh we'll give you this much amount of money the students will be provided i mean they recently in i think punjab mm-hmm. uh students will be given milk or fruits yeah but when you talk about the learning yeah. you know there has been several studies done every year you know the studies of asar shows mm-hmm. that uh, more than 50% of the students of grade 5 and grade 8 cannot read or write simple sentences in english or urdu and cannot do simple two digit divisions mm-hmm. um so those who are going to schools what's happening to them yeah what's happening in school so right now the students who are going to schools through certain incentives uh and even certain promises are being made you you create hopes such as that they'll become an officer they'll become a doctor mm-hmm. but the reality is the kind of education they have uh basically uh the hopes that you have built will crash very soon mm-hmm. and once that happens these young boys and girls they will lose trust yeah they will uh, the government will lose the credibility mm-hmm. and when these children grow up probably young girls would be you know sent for marriage yeah. at a very early age they will have their own children um and when the time for children is to go to school they probably may not send their children to school yeah can okay, go unke khwab tode gaye so the even though there have been incentives been put in place um what i fail to understand is at times is that are we is this a is this a because are we missing out over here or are we lacking in this because of policy or implementation or a mix of both society what would you consider to be that that main driving reason as to why the implementation of why education hasn't been passed on at, at such a large scale multiple issues mm-hmm. um, see we've got a huge population yeah and the country almost i believe two third of our country is youth mm-hmm. um, youth bulge it is yeah. and and to cater to that number is not easy yeah you you need a huge amount of money then where do you get teachers from yeah um a few weeks back i was talking to the sindh minister of education uh, minister sardar ali shah mm-hmm. and we were talking about schools in mithi thar thar pakar mm-hmm. and uh, he said dr jiva i'll make schools fine where will i get teachers from who will go will you go to teach there will you live there who will go and live there so these are real challenges yeah uh the areas where the population is so low mm-hmm. it's very difficult to find teachers so you need to have a long term strategies and planning which has been missing the mm-hmm. budgetary issues are there uh and have been there mm-hmm. then policies i would say those documents which were made were very good documents implementation was an issue mm-hmm. then the issue of uh 
politi- uh, politicizing things mm-hmm. interference mm-hmm. political in- interference happens how teachers are used during elections yeah you know when teachers are being hired before elections so all these uh, things you you have to look into is the intention mm-hmm. policies were made good policies were made implementation was wrong intentions mm-hmm. eventually uh, went wrong as well uh, and of course when you have teachers who are not qualified to be teachers and when they are in classrooms mm-hmm. you know they are the ones who build our careers Yeah. you know our parents you know if you are a child or now i am a parent i send my children to school yeah i'm dependent on the teachers to you know if i'm not an educationist if i'm a parent who is not from the field of education i would be 100% dependent upon yeah. them but what do you see even there in the private sector uh the teachers give that responsibility to the parents mm-hmm. aap apne bacche ko ye kar rahe hain ye kar rahe hain yeah and i always argue <clears throat> when you know my children go to school and when during the parent teacher meeting if teacher tells my wife you make sure that your child is doing this and you work with them and i would stop the teacher and i'll tell her that let her be mother her role is to provide love security to the yeah. child she has never had training in teaching before yeah you've had your training in teaching yeah. you know pedagogies yeah you know multiple strategies please you take your responsibility don't uh, give your responsibility yes yeah. yeah, this is because uh, a, a child is very sensitive you don't know what's happening in the brain of a child yeah uh uh and as a trained teachers mm-hmm. uh they know how psychology is working or should work yeah uh at times i've seen people even you know people that i know mm-hmm. they might say things to their children which they think mm-hmm. that if by uh using those choice of words yeah they will get better and they will understand for example you don't know anything you can't do anything yeah you don't know how those words how detrimental they can be yes yeah. because your brain is shielded by something called skull yeah and you can't see the damage yeah so uh you know even in private sector you know coming back to the private sector thing uh the issue is the training of the teachers yeah uh, if there are 22 million children who are being catered through private sector mm-hmm. uh, which has multiple segments uh, you know some are high fee yeah. uh, school some are low some are mid what kind of trainings are being provided to the teachers mm-hmm. if the private sector has taken such a burden and there has been a trust and credibility developed yeah in the society is the government providing any kind of subsidy or any kind of trainings mm-hmm. uh to these teachers from private sector schools yeah year after year you know there are millions of dollars being spent uh on public sector school teachers for training yeah they should have training definitely uh but you see the outcome has never been good so far year after year yeah. is the same outcome we still say that children are having difficulties in learning yeah uh teachers are not coming to schools these are major issues yeah but there's this bias towards private sector education having this great label or seeming accredited in some way which doesn't have the same level of capital deployment behind it yes yes and because the capital comes from the fees yeah and then you've got 5% bar yeah on increasing in the school fee yeah uh the inflation is going high and this year is going to be 20% yeah so where will the money come from mm-hmm. are you expecting private schools to shut down if we all shut down the private schools mm-hmm. 22 million children will be out of school yeah like this 
So uh, there has to be a strong partnership between yeah. uh, the public and private sector and must continue to grow. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of trust deficit mm -hmm. uh, and this will continue to grow if mm -hmm. they don't work together. There yeah. has to be initiatives uh, that has to come in. Once there is integrity there, mm -hmm. uh, there will be a lot of credibility mm -hmm. in those partnerships and the trust will develop within the society and things will move forward. Um, so both public-private has their own challenges, uh, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Regulatory issues are there. Uh, we need to also review the way we assess mm -hmm. uh, students in mm -hmm. school. Uh, you know, it's, it's about educational assessment, it's measurement of learn, uh, measurement of their content knowledge, their mm -hmm. skills and attitude. People don't know how to measure that. Yeah. Um, it's something, if I come with a, you know, I'd say, Asad, you know, my height is 10 feet. Mm -hmm. You will say, Shazad, most likely six, but not 10. I'll say, Asad, I've used this measurement tape. And this measurement tape tells me that I'm 10 yeah. feet. You will say either the measurement tape is wrong, either I did not use it properly, the measurement tape, or both are wrong. Yeah. In Pakistan and in most part of the world as well, yeah. um, assessment is not done correctly. The test tools are not made well. Yeah. And then when the student responds to those questions, those are not evaluated properly. So the kind of feedback you give to the students mm -hmm is wrong is not accurate but this is where i want to actually hear your thoughts and uh, i know we're, we're stretching we're, we're actually stressing on this uh, question a bit but um what defines the correct way of assessment in the first place because so far it seems or what my understanding is and what i hear from those around me is that assessment is always grade based which is somewhat quote unquote problematic uh, because you're setting a, a benchmark or a yardstick for students to abide by. And based on that benchmark is what you are, you know, gauging their understanding. And simple letters go into that assessment. Mm -hmm. What would be what would be a more effective way of assessing? Because I understand that, yes, assessment, there are issues in assessments all around. There's an issue of monitoring and evaluation all around the world. Uh, but what could be put in place in, in, instead where it's more individualized? Mm -hmm. And cater to actually ensuring uh -huh. that the concepts have been learned or that there's some actual development happening for the students. Absolutely. Uh, good, very good question. Um, as I said, assessment is like measuring knowledge. And, you know, the watch that you're wearing right now mm -hmm. is also measuring time. Yeah. If you're wearing a Rolex. Yeah. Still tells time. Tells time. But if you look behind mm -hmm. that watch. <clears throat> there will be plus minus certain percentage of error. Yeah. If you buy a low quality uh, watch, it will also have the same. Yeah. And if you buy the lowest quality of watch, it will also have an error. Yeah. Uh, we buy the same watch. We have the exactly same time put in there. After a few while, we look at the time. Your time will be different. Mine will be different. And mm -hmm. somebody else's will be different. Mm -hmm. so the measurement when it comes even in the machine, there, there is certain percentage of error. Yeah. When it comes to assessment of human knowledge, skills, uh, attitude, it becomes very complex. Yeah. Because there are humans who are involved. Yeah. So there's a lot of subjectivity that mm -hmm. can come into place. So how you can make it uh, valid, mm -hmm. how you can make it more reliable, how you can make it more fair is are the three strong pillars that you should have mm -hmm. in a system that can give uh, or bring you towards certain accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be still a lot of errors, but uh, you know, once you, for example, in schools, uh, when you have tests, uh, are other fellow teachers reviewing those test questions 
to give feedback mm-hmm. are we willing to take the feedback uh when we respond to the questions uh do we have a standardized marking schemes how do we develop standardized marking schemes uh do we give feedback or do we give numbers you know if you get 7 out of 10 what does that mean nothing has zero value yeah you know uh but the first thing the parents would say if if they look at 7 or 6 who got the highest ye yeah, baaki teen ka aa gaya bilkul uh wo itna padhte the aap nahi padhe you know all those things start yeah. to come into play uh maybe the teacher did not mark it well mm-hmm. uh i'll give you an example of of my child uh, so you know, recently she came up with a report card and uh, i i saw and i said you know i i don't see any correlation in your term grades or term marks to your final marks or or the final exams marks so i reached out to the school and i said you know why is that so <laughs> you know the first response i got was uh, something you know usually they have to learn the entire course so that's why the uh performance goes down fine then i probe more and then they said you know some you know what we do is try to make the final test paper more difficult well either you make the term test difficult as well mm. so each test tool has a similar level of difficulty yeah what is happening to my child is that during the term she is over the moon I know everything I'm doing so well. Yeah. And then you see the drop down. And it impacts a child psychology. Yeah. It it you know the sense of uh, self respect, self esteem, mm-hmm. it hits hard. What happened is just like any student who's going to any school and coming first all the time. Yeah. In the standardized test, he's not even in top 50 or top 100. so either the test tool of that school was not right mm-hmm. or the test tool of that sanitized test is not right yeah so the measurement yeah is important mm-hmm. and th- this is the job that i do every day is high stakes yeah so there's a huge responsibility yeah on us to to ensure that we are as accurate yeah uh as we can uh so that the students our stakeholders sees that integrity it builds in uh uh you know credibility in our qualifications mm-hmm. and society it builds in a lot of trust uh when i say society it can be schools it can be industries it could be universities you know if universities usually when they see aku examination board certificate yeah they know the student has come from a better system yeah uh if it's an industry mm-hmm. they'll say all right yeah. the the qualifications that a child is coming from uh mm-hmm. bringing yeah. uh with them is authentic you yeah. know it truly reflects their ability yeah uh unlike in many cases i don't want to take the names uh, but, but one is it, looked down upon than yeah, the other looked down upon the other and also uh when they apply for the entrance test yeah they are unable to pass their entrance test yeah uh so this creates a huge systematic problem mm-hmm. uh in the society mm-hmm. and you say how do we then adjust yeah. these students so everyone then starts lowering their standards yeah uh you go to karachi university you know, during my time we really enjoyed and there was a very good environment in our department yeah but recently when i met the professors and they said the intake uh of students is not of that quality that we used to uh get mm-hmm. uh what does that mean progression the grades yeah is not reflecting that ability yeah. which they expect yeah but they want to ensure that the machinery moves forward 
तो एडमिशन देते चलो चला दे बट इट इज रियली डैमेजिंग द एजुकेशन इंडस्ट्री एंड इवेंचुअली our uh, workforce you know workforce labor force yeah. so i'm going to segue a little bit um away from from this i feel like the conversation around the systemic issues are never ending um but uh, i want to know more about akueb what's the story behind it and how is it so different from existing boards in pakistan all right uh so i i've talked about some of the issues uh, yeah. in the learning and the assessment but I'll take you back to the mid 1990s. Uh, you know, AKU Examination Board uh, is not a brainchild of AKU; it's a brainchild of Educationists of Pakistan. They came to AKU president at that time uh, with a request to establish um, an examination board uh, led by the Aga Khan University. Mm-hmm. uh um, there was a task force that that was uh, made which sent a proposal to his highness the chancellor of the aga khan university who then approved it and then in uh in november 2002 uh through the ordinance of the government of pakistan uh aku examination board was established so the need that was identified mm-hmm. by uh the educationist of uh, the time was still uh Uh, very proud of those steps mm-hmm. that they took the initiatives the need was um, basically there has to be uh, a, a syllabi uh, based on minimum standards of the country at least mm-hmm. uh, which are learning outcome based yeah which are achievable as well yeah uh, we needed to have a system which can bring in quality of assessment mm-hmm. uh because if the quality of assessment is good then as i mentioned earlier you give the right feedback even it has a uh, an impact on the classroom teaching and learning mm-hmm. uh, for example if the benchmark of the assessment is to uh, is to memorize the content of the textbook then the teachers in the classroom will help the students to memorize the content of the textbooks hmm because everyone knows that the promotion to the next level is dependent on the scores of those tests uh and in many private schools if i say the appraisals of teachers is also dependent on the performance of the students yeah. in those tests um and then there was there were issues of corruptions cheating in the examinations yeah. uh the lack of trust and credibility in the qualifications and that is why aqep was established um and it has gone through a certain journey uh, where schools are now trusting the qualifications mm-hmm. universities are now trusting its qualifications um and it is because how our students are performing at the level of university and beyond mm-hmm. our students uh, we we measure our success yeah. based on uh, where our students ends up after graduating from grade 12 after yeah. giving our examinations uh, we do the survey every year and we have around 98% mm-hmm. response rate of the survey and that shows 92% of our students uh, are able to get admissions mm-hmm. in the university mm-hmm. and out of these 52% of our students get admission in top 15 university of pakistan okay uh you know around 4% of our students go to international universities and a lot of uh universities are providing scholarships to our students they are attracting i was students to apply to those mm-hmm. universities and i was very intrigued uh why is that so and i spoke to some vice chancellors mm-hmm. registrars of the universities and to give a crux uh what they say it is that it is not only the university mm-hmm. which brings in the intellectual environment in the campus yeah. but also the quality of students who augments the intellectual environment of yeah. the campus and that is what aku ev students bring in 
they uh-huh. add value to it uh, and i always tell them you know as, as a board which was made um, as a brainchild of education of pakistan mm-hmm. it was our role to carry them till grade 12th now we bestow this responsibility to you yeah to carry them forward and and take them through this journey uh-huh. of uh, an education where they become a lifelong learner yeah uh but for this to happen there are yeah. multiple aspects that we look into mm-hmm. uh how our examination syllabi is made mm-hmm. um you know there are higher cognitive levels mm-hmm. defined there for students it is helpful for teachers how mm-hmm. to start the teaching how to plan the teaching mm-hmm. um the way we develop questions mm-hmm. it probes high order thinking yeah you know the way we develop our test tools Mm-hmm. uh is such that you can go into the depth and the breadth yeah of the curriculum you know it's not about choosing and having a choice and mm-hmm. options uh you need to see and ensure that the vision of the country mm-hmm. or our curriculum uh is being met or not mm-hmm. how do you assess it you know we are the only examination board in the country which has uh, psychometricians Uh, which is an assessment department which ensures the quality of the uh, syllabi it ensures the quality of our test tools it yeah. ensures the quality of the scores that we provide you yeah. know, we do the post exam analysis yeah. and then the results are announced and this is year on year right yes this and we use technology as well yeah. you know and there are so many steps mm-hmm. uh, that are involved yeah. to ensure quality mm-hmm. um then we are the only exam board which provides support to schools mm-hmm. as i said earlier that who is supporting teachers yeah nobody is doing that mm-hmm. um so we have taken that responsibility to provide that support to our teachers to let them understand and know mm-hmm. uh, what our standards are and how to achieve those standards mm-hmm. agar malum hi nahi hoga to phir wo aage nahi badh pate okay uh and all the data that we uh, collect we do a lot of research and through those research uh we can as a board are able to uh, make informed decisions mm-hmm. we are able to provide a lot of feedback reports uh the kind of feedback reports schools are receiving from us mm-hmm. is something there's not a single examination board in the world who provides this kind of feedback the feedback is such that uh it's based on students performance in the exams and for every subject and every question a school is informed uh, through a comprehensive report how your students perform in this question of this subject at national level so they get to know where do they stand where mm-hmm. their strengths are where their weaknesses are they can plan it they can strategize it mm-hmm. uh and this is something that uh, because i am also part of uh, the board of trustees mm-hmm. of uh, international association for educational uh, assessment mm-hmm. uh, where more than 80 countries uh, examination boards are a part of it mm-hmm. um and during my discussions not a single examination board provide this kind of feedback which is very helpful schools have really transformed mm-hmm. we have some amazing amazing example of success mm-hmm. uh which you know gives us goosebumps whenever we yeah. think about it as brilliant um and i have now i have so many more questions but we're starting to approach the the 1 hour mark so i'm just going to try and <laughs> concise this into one heavy question um for you is that what is what is the day uh what what are your day to days like what are you mostly spending your time on focusing on because you've been with the the organization since 2014 it's been alive since 2002 mm-hmm. tons of data uh tons of experiments i'm sure that have been run lots of research lots of analysis post analysis as well where are you spending most of your time now to actually drive the organization for the next 5 years so um uh, you know as you said a lot of data has been we have a lot yeah. of data and then we do a lot of piloting as well uh to see how that would work uh we would definitely like to trans bring in transformation 
of further transformation in, in the field of assessment and examinations. Mm -hmm. You know, I was telling you earlier that, um, uh, you know, what does 70% mean? We want, now that we give feedback to schools, uh, which is uh, for the school teachers and principals, we want to bring a further shift mm -hmm. to give more feedback to students directly. Uh, we want to provide them uh, their cognitive level profiling, you know, so that they get to know in each subject uh, what is their cognitive level profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that will definitely create a lot of interest. You know, yeah. they will uh, appreciate what that 71% means or 81% means. Yeah. Uh, and I think also help them also maybe form a better decision of which direction they want to go to. Absolutely, absolutely. And the work that we've been doing for <clears throat> since 2015 on project-based learning, mm -hmm. which helps students to deep dive in, in learning, uh, that has been very successful. It has been even highlighted by UNESCO in their background research for the uh, the GEM reports, uh, in which they said uh, that AKU EB's middle school program promotes 21st century skills. So this is a program where we focus on project-based learning. Mm -hmm. And our focus is not the assessment of content. Our focus is on assessment of skills. Okay. Teachers are trained yeah. how to measure skills. We talk about uh, 21st century skills that are extremely important. Yeah. Who measures it? And by this, you mean that you've passed on the knowledge. Now see if the child's grabbed it or if, they've, if they're able to apply so, it. Yes. So the projects are developed in such a way that it's a part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. The content is there. But while they are in the process, the role of the teacher mm -hmm. is to observe and measure those skills. And there are certain rubrics given, which have been trial and tested, and and it's it's a you know it's giving a amazing results uh, to us. Uh, you know, when a child completes schools and when they are done with the university, they apply for jobs. They're searching for jobs. All the you know job ads. It talks about the first three things, uh, your qualification, your experience, your specialization. Mm -hmm. the rest of the things are skills. skills. Who has taught them? Who has measured for them? Yeah. Nobody. But that is the demand yeah. of the, uh, the global world. Yeah. Um, and this is something no one is doing. Uh, again, I would say mm -hmm. globally, the kind of work that we are doing. Yeah. Uh, this is something that we are moving now towards grade four and five at primary level. Okay. We're not shifting towards uh, grade three and uh, below that because uh, that is the expertise that we don't have to be very honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but from grade four and five uh, that we are planning to launch next year. Mm -hmm. And also in grades nine, 10th and 11th and 12th, project-based learning will become part of the component, you know, we will start off with uh, science practicals right now. Mm -hmm. Globally, if you see, yeah. uh, students are not um, enjoying the process of the science practicals. It's just an activity or an exercise that they go in the laboratory, they do it, they come out, that's it. You know, they, they fill in the journals, get it signed. We want to add value to yeah. it. And slowly and gradually, hopefully, uh, if we are, if we have a successful pilot at mm -hmm. grade nine, ten, and eleven and twelve, mm -hmm. this will give us a huge boost to introduce it in other subjects as well. Right. And then we need to figure it out yeah. how we place it in certain subjects, how we can put into weighted. Mm -hmm. But for this, you need to have a huge trust mm -hmm. with the schools, the teachers, the students, and the board. Yeah, you know. That is something with time, it will evolve. Lots um, of stakeholder management. Yes, this, and yeah. how you can just transform the teaching and learning maybe. Uh, right now, we are covering around 20% of our curriculum through project-based learning. Mm -hmm. I would like to see 70 to 80% of mm -hmm. the curriculum to be covered through project-based learning. Mm -hmm. uh, it will just transform uh, the teaching and learning 
yeah. uh, process in its own. Uh, so these are some areas that I've mentioned about what I would like to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of work has been done already. Uh, materials are ready. Uh, we are waiting for the right time uh, for grade four and five. Mm-hmm. And hopefully uh, we can formulate um, a plan to built in as a pilot for grade nine to grade 12 mm-hmm. project based learning. Uh, hopefully by 2024. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so I have one last question for you. Um, I'm sorry to take up your time as well in this, but if you could, and this is a question I ask everybody. So based on what you've shared with me today, um, if you could go back in time and you could meet your younger self, what would you say to him? Good question. Uh, Need time to reflect as well. But the first thing I see is show uh, more aggression uh, be more bold um, and never think that you can't do it. And the reason I say this is that when I was applying for my PhDs, I started applying to mediocre universities outside Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And I was told by my parents that uh, if you want to go to mediocre universities, it's better you stay in Pakistan. And the reason I applied in those mediocre universities because that uh, that confidence was not there. You know, went to low cost private school, government college, public sector university. But I think you know anyone can achieve it. And uh, my PhD thesis eventually got uh, Toby Jackman Prize uh, mm-hmm. in uh, at Cambridge uh, for the best PhD thesis in any subject. Uh, but during the entire time, I was always wondering if mm-hmm. uh, I had more opportunities, uh, if I had created more opportunities for myself, I think I could have achieved more in chemistry. But, well, no regrets. I've learned a lot yeah. and life continues. Uh, I can pass on the knowledge to others. Maybe yeah. they can fulfill their dreams or create their own dreams yeah. and make us all proud. Yeah. Great, great. Um, it's great to see that you've stepped in this role where now it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that based on what you've experienced growing up, based on what exposure you've had locally and globally, it's now you're in this role where you can pass this on at a much larger scale as well and hopefully change the game. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Inshallah. but thank you. Thank you so much for taking out the time. I'm sorry we couldn't touch all the questions in this. Uh, we just scratched the surface of the work that's happening at AKUB. Maybe we do a second episode. Hopefully, yes. Um, yeah. That's a very polite way of saying I talk too much. No, no, not at all. It's, <laughs> if anything, I this is probably one of the episodes where I've been the most calm, where I've really enjoyed just hearing the guest also. I didn't have, I didn't want to interrupt you, if anything, because I just wanted you to get it out, let it soak in also. I also had to reflect. So it was, it was happy. I was, I was very happy to hear Thank what you. you were saying. Thank you once again for taking out the time. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Shazad Jeeva. Uh, the CEO of the Akhan University Examination Board. My name is Asad Hashmali and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.